Welcome to the Mindful Healers podcast with Dr. Jesse Mahoney and Dr. Ni Cheng Liang. We are physicians and leaders who are also trained in coaching, yoga, mindfulness, and integrative medicine. We are also mothers, spouses, sisters, daughters, aunts, and friends. In this podcast, we share candid, heart-centered, loving, science-based, thoughtful, and often fun conversations about the challenges life throws at us. With our collective experience of over 30 years in physician and personal wellness, we reflect and offer pearls of wisdom for navigating life's challenges with more ease. From parenting, marriages, money scarcity, cancer survivorship, uncertainty, challenges in practicing medicine, we cover it all. We invite you to refresh your perspective and empower yourself with mindset, mindfulness, and other well-being tools that actually work. A quick reminder that nothing in our podcast is medical advice. Today, we are going to talk about sitting on nails. And the idea of sitting on a nail came up recently at the Brave Enough 2024 conference in a beautiful talk by Dr. Sonal Harder. And this idea of sitting on a nail is also the topic of a YouTube video about a dog sitting on a nail and not moving because of the discomfort involved in moving. And as we listened, we both shared that we sit on nails very often in life and don't move because the initial movement can cause more pain. And you very likely do too. Our intention for today is to explore where we may be sitting on nails and not changing our positions or removing the nail due to the fear of the discomfort. And the takeaway of this episode is another powerful mindfulness tool, the power of noticing and awareness. Before we delve into this concept of sitting on nails, we will take our usual pause to practice a bit of self-compassion and shift our nervous system so that as we delve into the topic of where we might be in pain and causing ourselves pain, we have more capacity and softness and clarity. And so finding a comfortable seat, find your sit bones, and if it's safe to do so, close your eyes. And the invitation, if it's also safe to do so, is to bring a hand to heart. And if you can't do that, leave your hands on the steering wheel and your eyes open and just take a breath or two in through your nose and potentially out through your mouth. Do what feels good. Allowing your nervous system to unwind for a moment. Noticing that we can feel good in brief bits whenever we choose, breathing in and out. <clears throat> and perhaps connecting with non-judgment, non-judgment for where you are, how you got here, connecting to kindness, kindness to yourself for being a human who does the best she or he or they can, and a connection to compassion, compassion for yourself, compassion for humans, everywhere, and maybe an intention for curiosity, being open-minded, considering different perspectives and options. And then to bring in some love. Sending yourself some love and all humans everywhere, some love. Take in a big deep breath. Notice how you feel. Notice that neurochemical soup circulating around, let it feel good. And as you open your eyes, looking around and noticing the world around you, 
promoting hands. We'll come back together to talk about nails. So I wanted to share that this analogy of sitting on a nail was actually brought up to me years ago by one of my first mindfulness-based stress reduction teachers, the very wise and lovely Livia Walsh. And when we were engaging basically in the very experiential mindfulness-based stress reduction class, the teaching was that there was going to be a lot of potential shifts and we might notice that those shifts are uncomfortable, even if they offer a path or a circumstance with much more spaciousness and freedom, because we've been so accustomed to our automatic reactivity, our discomfort of sitting on a nail. Like we've actually gotten used to that discomfort of our very narrow and not optimal or not potentiated circumstance. And so that initial instinct, once we realize that there's a different way or a different opportunity to change, is actually to get back on that nail because that's what we've been so accustomed to. And so in actuality, the nail doesn't have to continue to have the same relationship with you. Oftentimes a nail is something that is external to you, literally, and it's not your fault. But in order to change the circumstance of the nail, you need to be willing to lean into getting curious about the resistance surrounding leaving the discomfort that you're so used to. And hearkening back to a recent podcast we just recorded with Dr. McKenna, getting curious about that discomfort. So I'm going to take it one more step and invite you to get curious about the discomfort, about leaving the discomfort. Whoa. <laughs> I often say in coaching, we're comfortably uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I also want to throw in here that in medicine and in our culture in general, we're also taught that there's some valor or glorification of feeling uncomfortable and suffering and struggling and that we engage in collective suffering and suff uh, and struggling very frequently. And in many ways, many people are think that that is sort of the way you are supposed to move through the world. If you are suffering and struggling, then you're doing good work. Um, so considering that impact as well. And one of the other thoughts to consider here is that when we sit and begin to notice this idea of where we're sitting on a nail, or I might add, choosing to sit on a nail, um, that we turn our lens to this. And what I discovered is when I could look at it compassionately and curiously, I had a few things that sort of um, popped up right away. And I would give this suggestion of like procrastination is definitely sitting on a nail. I have to renew my pediatric boards and I have one thing left to do and it's not that big a deal and I just don't do it. Um, and I'm comfortable sitting on that nail. And yet if I would just do it and I could have done it in January, it would have been done and it wouldn't have had to be on my list. And I think so many of us do that because we're comfortable with it and or um it's just what we're used to, as you mentioned. And then I think once we start to look for these little things that maybe aren't emotionally laden, we then start to notice a whole watershed of things underneath. And something that has come up for many people I work with is relationship challenges where we sit on a nail, stories that we tell, expectations that we have, where we're really choosing to sit on a nail and not make a change. Or some people staying in jobs that... Um, as we talked about yesterday, I just love this analogy. They've outgrown the pot and like their roots are like trying to break through the bottom and yet they're comfortably uncomfortable. And so they don't make a change. I have many examples to share. Let's go back first to the practice of medicine in general. So many of you know that I used to be in ac academics. And so the additional non-clinical work as many of you who are in academics know, is basically on our own time. 
the talks that we have to prepare for, the talks that we have to give, the additional teaching, the additional presentations at conferences that are oftentimes unpaid, sitting on different committees and going to those meetings and prepping for those committees with different tasks and being on task forces. All of those are needed in part for our work for promotions and to maintain our reputation in our teaching community and in the community at large and to continue to be, and I'm going to put in air quotations, a team player. <laughs> when much of this non-clinical work may actually be at odds with my own priorities, my own home priorities. Namely, very importantly, the health and well-being of myself and also of my family. And so the nail also, in part, was my ego. And sometimes it still is. So I have moved beyond the nail that was not in alignment for me about all of the other non-clinical work. But now my next level is about my ego. The nail is my ego. And I recognize it much quicker thanks to the hard work that has been amassed over the last couple of years. So when I'm veering towards the comfort of the well-known discomfort, like the titles that I might acquire, the volunteer leadership positions that have been quote unquote offered to me, the talks that I should be giving at a particular conference, even if it's paid because I have that particular expertise. I've definitely shared with you also, Jesse, on, in little text message streams that I feel those tugs, those tugs from my ego nail that I'm going to mm -hmm. affectionately name, but I'm definitely much better about noticing that desire to get back on the nail and severing that tug when I can check in about the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that I have surrounding that particular tug. I also wanted to share some more current nails. So the Current podcast is being recorded on my desk and my desk is a mess. Like if I took a picture of it, it would be like the antithesis of Jesse's desk who um, I was very honored to be able to, to witness and, and see and experience at her lovely new home in Nicasio. And it is like the opposite. It is full of books and the books aren't even stacked. They're just kind of like teeter tottering, like magical balancing acts. And there's different um, crafts and different um, pieces of luggage that haven't been unpacked. So it is the antithesis of my esteemed co-host's desk. And so I'm facing this like in real time, as you were talking, I was like, oh, <laughs> the current nail that I'm sitting on is actually related to decluttering. And I know I have to do it. I, I know I should do it. And I know that it would be more in alignment with allowing for literal spaciousness in the exploration um, of my authentic self. But, and I don't want this to sound like an excuse, but I guess in terms of getting curious about the discomfort surrounding the discomfort of having to like purge and get rid of stuff is that very frankly speaking, it is a fact that I grew up with financial scarcity and there is a lot of scarcity in my childhood. And so um, I think that there's something there <laughs> and there's something that I wanna get curious about with the hand to heart that you led us through just now, Jesse. Um, but I'm putting it out there in the universe to our podcast listeners that, uh, my desk will get decluttered soon. <laughs> well, and you bring up a really good point that we shouldn't use these things against us because sometimes our nails are very legit and came from experiences. But I think the power, as we mentioned, the takeaway of this episode is the noticing and awareness. Because once you see that you're sitting on it and once you see that you are painting yourself, um, you can then decide to change it if you want. And it, I often will talk to people about maybe 
you know, we're often not ready to change it. We tend to be high achievers and we need to change it now, but maybe you could change your relationship. I'm going to throw in there with clutter. That would be a great podcast episode. We're going to do that one. Um, maybe I'll coach you on clutter. Uh, it'll be really fun. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, soften your relationship with it. Maybe it's not a measure of failure, for example. It's just your next area of decluttering. And I might even say you've de decluttered a lot of thought patterns in your life. So maybe you're ready to declutter and change your relationship with scarcity and stuff. And um, the snail could be really cool. All right, looking forward to the discomfort of that upcoming podcast episode. <laughs> um, and then one that is kind of literal and kind of funny that I'm going to share with you because it is the, um, the we're heading into the weekend before the San Diego Dragon Boat Festival, which is our home festival. It's a pretty important festival for my uh, cancer survivor Dragon Boat team, Team Survivor San Diego. So I've been paddling with this awesome team of women identifying cancer survivors for the last six years. And I have been paddling without a butt pad. A butt pad is basically a pad. Sometimes it's homemade, like with those um, grippy uh, cabinet liners, like the little mm, rubbery grippy cabinet liners atop some foam, or you can get like a fancy butt pad like I had to get from an actual uh, dragon boat or paddling company. So the thought behind not having a butt pad was that I thought that it was going to offer me a lot more control and options in terms of my body positions during races. But I also realized that I had been using it as an internal badge of honor that I quote unquote, didn't need a butt pad because I was tough enough to endure the pain on my behind but after honestly being in much more frequent and many more rigorous practices, because our coach and our whole team has really de decided that we want to level up in time for our next competition next weekend, my backside started really hurting, like getting really sore the day after. And so I finally gave in, quote unquote, uh, and bought a nice dragon boat specific butt pad to try it out just to just be curious about it. Like what was the sensation and what was the circumstance if I actually got myself a butt pad? And honestly, I'm sticking with it. It really has changed my paddling experience for the better. And because of that pad, I have more traction with my body and can thus feel like I have a stronger stroke because of that stability in keeping my butt where it's at and not sliding around on the bench. And also, most importantly, my backside is happier because it's not in so much pain during and after practice. So I know you have thoughts about that, Jessica. I have so many thoughts about that. First of all, <laughs> I am so appreciating your honesty today because I'm just full of laughs and it's fantastic. And I'm laughing with you and I, uh, it's, it's absolutely 100% loving amusement. Um, and I have many of these same tendencies. They look different in my life. I, you are absolutely right. I have a very not cluttered house, um, but, it, but I have many of the other, I sit on a lot of nails. Um, but what I thought was so interesting in what you said is that for you to change, it had to get so bad. And I think that's mm -hmm. so true for so many of us. It has to get terrible before we'll make a change. I see so many people who only will come to coaching when like they just can't go on. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what if we gave ourselves tools, a butt pad and or some mindset work and or I don't know, a mammogram <laughs> before something happens, right? And it's just sort of thinking like, where are we waiting for things to get so bad to make a change? People won't change their jobs. In fact, in medicine, we kind of think we can't change our job unless it's absolutely terrible. Um, and so it's this idea of, maybe deserving, maybe enough, but I actually think it's the, the comfort with the discomfort where, okay, you are literally, you're not sitting on a nail. You were sitting on a, I don't know what it is, a piece of plank, but, but it had to get yeah. so bad. <laughs> and then you caught yourself, but that word I gave in, you gave in and bought a butt pad. Like, what if you just like got reasonable? What if you actually like had some clarity or decided to value yourself as opposed to giving in? We often talk about the importance of words, but wow, that was a good one, right? Um, mm -hmm. I do think people 
but somehow feel like they've given up. Um, I had someone start coaching this week who was like, I finally just gave up thinking I could do it myself. I'm like, well, you know, what mm -hmm. if you just decided to invest in yourself? Or what if you just decided that help helps, right? But I think it's interesting because that's the language that we use and it's um, not self-compassionate friend, right? And so it's like surreptitiously mm -hmm. mean to ourselves that you had to give up to support your rear end. Um, so right. I'm thinking, and, and what you discovered, which is what many people discover is when we um, get off the nail, not only is it we're out of pain, but it's actually a performance tool, right? You're paddling better and harder and faster. And so this idea of getting off the nail can be a tremendous performance tool. And it reminds me of a, of a coaching tool that comes um, in its origins from Byron Katie. And it's, who would you be without? And she says, without that thought. Um, and I often will talk to people, well, who would you be if you didn't make decisions from guilt, for example? But I might just, if we're connecting to a nail, who would you be without sitting on a nail, all these nails? Or who would you be if you... <laughs> bought yourself a butt pad at the very beginning, right? And didn't think it was a problem to do it or we don't want to waste money, but we don't think about all the other things we're wasting by literally being in pain. I will say it was the best $25 I have ever spent on myself for my rear end ever. <laughs> yeah, I can think of so many things. So that this that actually I very much relate to that I don't buy because I actually am the opposite. I, well, I like to be a minimalist but therefore I'm like, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. And then I'll get it. And I'll say like, wow, this is amazing. And so I think there's just a happy place in between. And if you are onto yourself, um, I often will have to say, well, if I buy this and the 25 bucks is wasted, the world won't end because that's how my scarcity plays. And so and you can always return things too, as it turns out. Um, but I then I'm like, well, I don't want to have to return it. So I'll just never buy it and rather just be in pain, for example. So just recognizing. Well, your I'm going to call you out. Actually, yeah. I'm going to call you out. because You are actually a discerning minimalist, right? Yeah. So you have abundance in your home after visiting it with, mm -hmm. you know, my mindful eye, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you have a drawer, like one of the largest drawers in your kitchen is all tea. So <laughs> that is not minimalist. <laughs> well, that's not actually, you have so to- I learn. want you to label it from a burning minimalist. Yeah, but that tea is not actually for me. Um, I only drink mint tea. So I, I'm a minimalist there. Um, and actually the Dracula's blood orange iced tea, but that's the retreat drawer of tea. Um, and I have all this tea from all the mm -hmm. retreats that I've done. And um, so I am a little bit like you because I don't want to throw it away. And there's also people like you who come and are so excited about it. And so I really need a double drawer of tea. And as many people who've joined me for retreats know, like tea is a thing and tea is very healing and it's very mindful to drink tea and to make tea. Um, and the other thing is that my husband likes, we've talked about this very different tea. You can't be everybody's cup of tea, but you like different kinds of tea. So he likes the more oolongy, sharp, not sweet, not herbal tea. And I like, you know, the Earl Grey, the, the mint tea. These days I'm only on mint tea. Someone told me it's good for menopause and then I liked it. So, um, but I'll change it up. That's kind of how I, how I roll with my tea, but you're right that, um, I am a discerning minimalist. So uh, it's also easier for me to buy things for other people than myself. Isn't that interesting? So I can sit on a nail, but other people can't sit on nails, right? That's our view. And that's our view, our medicine lens. It's so interesting. So I thought I would reflect a little bit also on this idea that um, common thought patterns that we talk about here in this podcast and beliefs will keep us sitting on nails. And so you mentioned scarcity, which wasn't even um, in my thought pattern here, but of course, um, scarcity is one. And this concept too, that many people struggle with, they're not deserving of better or um, suffering is actually a value or um, that you know somehow uh, getting off a nail and not being in pain or having an easy life is not a value. And then um, we're often used to it. So we just don't even notice the nails. 
And it makes me think about what else are you used to in your life that's actually causing you pain, that's actually sitting on a nail. And if you were willing to have a little bit of discomfort to change, right? Transition is always change. You could change it, whether it's your job, maybe an old friend relationship that's not serving you anymore. Maybe it's people pleasing or perfectionism, right? You can make this decision. And yes, the change is uncomfortable. When you disappoint someone, oh boy, is that uncomfortable. Um, or when you set a boundary. And yet, as you have so beautifully demonstrated this year, when you set healthy boundaries and brave boundaries, things get better in your life and life is better. And But it is very uncomfortable. And, you know, in medicine, we're trained to avoid discomfort. So our, our training to avoid discomfort, that it could be dangerous, means that we sit on many more nails than other people. Um, we also have a tremendous fear of making mistakes. I wanted to just backtrack for a minute about the boundaries, because in medicine, in training, I remember being on consult services and being told, we need to be like a sieve, like we will take all of the consults and help. And that's fine when we're in training, but as attendings, um, we definitely have to enforce and be clear about our boundaries in the practice of medicine. Um, I think about like, for instance, patient behavior, um, entitlement, um, unreasonable expectations, for instance. Like all of those things actually, as we're talking about it, are, are nails that are difficult to remove in medicine, but we need to remove them. Yeah. Lack of boundaries in and of itself is a nail. It's a very sharp nail and it is very uncomfortable to get off, right? When you swish over, the pain is more greater and then it's better once you're off the nail. And so that's really a, um, a beautiful one. And then even just fear of change, so, or fear of judgment when you set a boundary or being seen in a certain way, other people resenting you or saying something about you. Um, those worries about how we are perceived and it really comes down to people pleasing, really keeps us sitting on so many nails. And then um, guilt keeps us sitting on a lot of nails. <laughs> and for me, it's the avoidance of shame that keeps me on nails. Um, and were I to fail or were I to mess up or were someone to call me out or even, you know, I probably have a little bit of shame. Like if things are going well. I grew up in a space where like, no, you're supposed to be here working hard and like pleasure and joy is not necessarily the focus. And then the other thought pattern that I think really gets in our way is catastrophizing as to what might happen if you shift up the nail. So you might as well stay on the nail. Like who knows? what it's like out there reminds me of that page in the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse by Charlie Macasey. And it's like, it's the wild out there. Imagine if we didn't fear it. And that's very much an analogy for um, if you don't fear getting off the nail, whatever the discomfort is, you'll never know how amazing it is out there. A big nail are, um, basically like false beliefs in general. Uh, for instance, for me, I had mentioned earlier in the podcast episode is that false belief in that internal badge of honor with my ego. So could your ego be a nail? And that somehow I'm a failure if I opt for the more easeful, comfortable option, right? Like that's absolutely a false belief. So we've had quite a rich conversation. It's been honest and lovingly amusing. Um, and at this point, we're going to wrap up with some reflection questions for you, dear listener. Where are you sitting on a nail? What work is needed to change so you can shift off the nail? And asking these reflection questions today has brought up something that I don't think I've shared in this podcast and feels really important that things we often tell others are what we need to hear ourselves. And so for you and I, we need to sit down and think about what work we need to do to shift off our nail, whether it's decluttering or 
in my case, going and doing the board paperwork um, and a few other things. Yes, and thank you for reminding um, me as well that getting help helps, right? This is a common theme, common message that we have strong throughout all of our podcast episodes. Sometimes the nail is intergenerational trauma. Sometimes the nail is current generation trauma. Sometimes the nail is something that you need additional support to help you shift off of. Um, and so that's when the mental health and coaching world are so important as resources to lean into and get curious about. And mindfulness is the other super important resource here because without the noticing and awareness, um, it is really hard to change. And coaching can help you with that mindfulness and awareness and therapy can help you with that mindfulness and awareness and so many other potential interventions, even just slowing down and pausing and resting and refilling your energy helps you with the clarity and awareness. And self-compassion is the other one that we practiced at the beginning that's so critical. So on that vein, um, I will encourage you to join us in the Mindful Healthcare Collective to grow a mindfulness practice. Join Ni Chang and I next year for our uh, Connect in Nature Mindful Healers Retreat, which of the retreats I offer is the one that has the most intentional smorgasbord of mindfulness teaching in it. And we will release the date soon, but get on the um, email list for the Mindful Healthcare Collective and or the Pause and Presence email list so you know when the dates are and don't miss the signups. And then if anyone wants to tackle these things urgently, um, or uh, let me say they're top of mind and top of your list, reach out for coaching now because if you want to use up your CME funds, now is the time, not in December. Uh, you need to be finished so you can get your certificate in December. So get started now and reach out. And then I have a couple spots in one of my upcoming retreats in Nicasio because all the fall retreats filled. So I added this one at the last minute. And so there are a few spots, which is rare. So you can begin this work now. And for many people working on it intensely um, with the support of a community and the support of mindfulness practices is really a kind and loving gift. So I would love to have you join me. If that works for you, you can reach out. And we hope that today's podcast was uh, eye-opening for you. And we wish you less nails um, in your rear end going forward. Thanks so much for joining us. We encourage you to dive into the show notes for each episode for more learnings and resources. We also invite you to take a listen to the many other Mindful Healers podcast episodes and please share the podcast far and wide with colleagues, friends, and family. If our message and approach resonate with you, we would love to work with you. When you listen to a podcast, you consume information, but when you work with us, you can actually practice and change. We offer coaching and mindfulness experiences, talks, workshops, retreats, and more. Connect with us at the mindfulhealerspodcast.com. The content of this podcast is not medical or life advice. We invite you to participate in the mindful moments we offer at the end of most of our podcasts, but please only do so safely.